Congratulations, you found the one station that plays Ghana's best urban music. Listen to YFM 107.9 Accra, 102.5 Kumasi, and 97.9 in Takarati. Shouts going out to the Joyce Abbebio Creative Design College. You guys are showing us mad love on your social media. I appreciate that. Um, of course, our president is in the building. Now, according to Muichia Prada, I hope I got the name right, Muichia Prada. My Italian is very bad. What you wear is how you present yourself to the world, especially today uh, when human contacts are so quick. Fashion is an instant language. Indeed, fashion is one of the main conduits for human expression and to a very large extent, how we choose to communicate our emotions our emotional status and all that our social status all that our guest today on the wildly debauch series ladies and gentlemen uh, is on a mission to impact the fashion changing multi-million dollar fashion industry that is largely untapped here in Africa her vision is to change this perception and to make people appreciate the polished natural and nurtured talents Madame Joyce Abebio is a multiple award winning and founder uh, as well as president of the Joyce Abebio College of Creative uh, design we are much much honored to have you with us today madam welcome to yfm for wiley debut series thank you i i'm i'm so happy to have you here i mean when i was told last week that we're having madam joyce come through i was super happy because i'm i have a lot of interest in fashion but unfortunately i didn't really get the chance to you know pursue it it's never too late so when i when i drive by the 37 road there's a big signboard that has your name on there. Whenever I go to Accra, I look at it. When I'm coming back, I look at maybe somewhere along the line, I might take up a, a fashion course, you know, in the school and become a designer, you know, bring my clothes out and call it maybe Eskino Bellino. That's just by the way. Mommy, welcome. How's your day going so far? How's your morning? Oh, my morning is great. I'd be glad if you could get closer to the microphone. Yes, yes. So we can hear you loud and clear. Great, I think this is perfect. Great. Thank you so much. Mommy, let's talk about your childhood. Let's take it way back. I mean, all the way back to when you were born. What were some of the exciting things you remember whenever somebody asked you anything about growing up? The very exciting ones. Let's start from there. Um, well, that's a bit long, I think. Well. And uh, some of us have been here quite a while. <laughs> so... Uh, exciting things, uh, can't think of much. Mm. Uh, it would have to do with something to do with school or something of that mm. sort. But I'm looking at you and you're kind of young, so whatever I'll tell you, you probably won't know anything about it. Well, not for my sake, I mean, <laughs> for the sake of the many... Do you uh, remember uh, Osofu Dazi? Yes. You, you know the, the those who are in it, right? Yes, the drama group. Yes, I had one of them chase me from school one time all the way to the house. And as I was walking fast, he was also walking fast. And I started running, he was running. <laughs> and then we get to the house and I'm screaming my mother's name and she comes out to ask him, why are you following my daughter? And he says, oh, I saw her and I thought she was very beautiful. So I wanted to know her. <laughs> So uh, for years I was teased with this. Wow. You know, uh, I'm not going to give you the name, the name of the, right? the, the character because mm. I might just have a name from this one. So give us clues. Give, there. give us clues. <laughs> give us clues. Um, clues. 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 Was he very popular? Very very popular. He was very popular in the Osofu Dazi group. Mm. Ken, can you help us out? <laughs> <laughs> See, I told you, you're all very young. How, how young were you back then? I mean, around that time, how young were you? I was in you? class five, I think. Wow. Class five. Maybe, maybe he saw uh, the acting spirit in you. Maybe he wanted to make you an, an actress. <laughs> did you grow up in Ghana? Tell us, tell us where you grew yes, up. Yes, I did. Mm. Uh, I was born here mm. and I grew up in Ghana. Mm. Um, my parents, my dad was the regional commissioner for Brongahafu region during right. the Nkrumah regime. 
and my mother was a fashion designer as well wow so i i grew up here i went to school here i uh went to primary school in datus the one datus at uh, yes exactly and then moved on to achimuta secondary school great what are some of the family values that your parents instilled in you and your siblings how many siblings do you have my mother's side, we are five. Okay. And I'm the last one. Baby last? Yes. That must have been nice in the house. I mean, you get everything. Uh, I'm a different sort of last born, I think. Okay. <laughs> How different? Uh, because I, I tend to play the role as a first born as opposed to a last born. So is it right if we say we are penisem? Um, yes, I you suppose you could say that. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Beautiful. So what were some of the values, you know, your parents instilled in you? Uh, things that you picked from home, from your parents, your mom, your dad? Hard work. Mm. My mom. All I remember all my life was she was always working. Mm. Very determined to see us all through mm -hmm. uh, school outside of the country. So I watched her work very hard all my life. And I think that's what I picked from her. Working very hard. Your dad? My dad was a, uh, like I said, a minister, and he was being moved from one place to the next place to the next. So, and each time he moved with my siblings. I okay. think I was the only one that my mother kept stable in one place. So I barely saw him. Great. Let's talk about Achimota. I remember, I think in the beginning when you talked about your the most exciting things in your life you 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 pointed at achimota all mm -hmm. right tell us your days there uh, any memorable moments i mean uh, notable classmates how were your days like there achimota was a, a do or die thing for me mm -hmm. i had to go to achimota any means possible it, no, it was first choice second choice third choice <laughs> it had to be achimota or nothing wow. for me so it was quite exciting when the letter eventually showed up for me to go to Achimota mm. Secondary School. Um, I liked everything about Achimota. I mean, I felt like it was, I belonged. Mm. That was home place. for you. That was home for me. Mm. So everything there was perfect as far as I'm concerned. Mm. Looking back at your childhood and education in particular, um, are there any, I mean, is there anything you wish you had done differently? You, you, you sit here now as Madame Joyce Abebeu, very famous, you're well accomplished. You look back to growing up. Are there things you wish you had done different? Nothing. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. I think uh, I'm at a place where I feel like it's my calling, what mm -hmm. I'm doing. Mm -hmm. So I think I have arrived at what I was supposed to do in the first place. And I've always followed it. So. I don't have regrets in anything that I have done. The only thing was in the selection of medical technology going to, but then I didn't have a choice then. Yeah, so I had to I do a year and a half of it first. Wow. So that's the only thing I can think of, but I always followed the path I wanted. After Achimota, you mentioned that you had to leave Ghana and go study in the USA. Was mm -hmm. that your first time leaving the country? No. It wasn't. I used to travel a bit with my mom, mm. mostly to London. The entire family lives there so. Mm. so it wasn't any different feeling for you the different feeling was going to the u.s okay because i hadn't been there okay but i'd been to london do you remember the first day you landed in the u.s yes yes i remember my brother forgot to pick me up from the airport so i do remember that first <laughs> it <laughs> left me in the airport for hours claiming that they went to buy a car Wow. And then the traffic kept them. So I remember that day, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, Ken, this thing has to... It's painful, though. I mean, to, to get to an airport and then 2018, mm -hmm. I get to JFK. I call my big brother and say, oh, you came? <laughs> oh, um, I, we are at an event somewhere around. And this man lies to me that it's an hour or two drive. He actually gets there in three hours. And then later... We're coming back to the same airport from the same place and it takes us 25 minutes. <laughs> Means he literally just decided to forget me. I mean, leave me there to survive on my own. Um, how did the process of integration go for you when you landed in the US to pursue your tertiary education? I mean, it wasn't your first time traveling, but then how was it like uh, coming from Ghana to study? Were you treated different in your school? Yes, definitely. I went to one of those uh, college uh, schools in a college town, sort of. Mm. And they were not very comfortable with blacks at the time. Mm. This was in the 80s. Okay. So, not very comfortable with them, with us having an accent. They didn't understand anything we mm -hmm. said. 
and uh, it was just tough. And also uh, getting to school and realizing the way and the structure of the school is very different from what from we what are have, yeah. very used to. We do the true and poor mm -hmm, system, mm -hmm. and there's you have to read a lot and understand it and mm. be able to discuss in a huge auditorium. So that was a challenge. So my first semester was very hard. It took sitting in the library every day to be able to catch up with what was happening in the classrooms. Wow. And you left here for medicine or medical technology. Yes. Right. Um, at what point or what accounted for that radical switch? I mean, I read somewhere that you just decided I'm not doing it again. Oh, no, no, no. Medical technology was a selection because of a process that was in Ghana at the time. Okay. I actually applied, you know, they used to have a secretariat that actually approved you're going to the U.S. Yeah, yeah. Only because somebody had to pay your fees. I think you already mentioned that. Yeah. Yes, mm -hmm. exactly. So uh, when I applied with fashion design, they turned me down. Why? It wasn't on the list, you know, until okay. today, you guys still don't want to <laughs> Put lift us up. <laughs> so, uh, one of them actually told me that pick a course that we will approve. So, that's what I picked. So, I picked it just to get the approval and to, then for, the, for the banks to transfer my school fees and stuff. And that. So, when I got there, I had to stay in that field for a period of time and then eventually I spoke with the advisors and informed them that really this is what I would like to do and so I switched to what I wanted to do. So I mean if I'm not mistaken this was a plan it was an advice from one of them. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like okay if you can't really do what you want to do do what is possible now, mm -hmm. get in there, get your feet in there, and then you can switch. Then I can do what I want, yeah. But I mean, were your parents in on this plan? I mean, this advice that was given to you, did they know about My it? My mom always knew what I wanted to do. Okay. She, she knew that I wanted to do fashion design and, and knew that I would had to make that decision mm. to be able to uh, get the approval that I needed. Mm. But dad was not in on this. My mom and my dad separated when I was about seven years old. Mm. So uh, he wasn't really a part of my life that much. Okay. So I only visited during vacations and stuff. But my mother raised me. So. Okay. So this was a plan. I mean, you wanted to do fashion and then you had to switch, do medical technology because that was what was available. I mean, you had to get there and then switch. But then, um, did you, at what point did you realize fashion was your thing? Was it growing up with mom? I think I've always known. You've always known. I've always been. Uh, it's always come very easy for me. I could make my own clothes while we were in Achimota and all that. So I've always, I always knew that was an area I was going to get into. Mm. I think I hadn't pinpointed it very well when I was in Achimota, but when I was done and ready to leave, I knew that was what I wanted. This was it. Yeah. Mm. So the plan came into being. It worked. You switch. How did the whole fashion career thing kick off for you? I mean, what was the first stage for you professionally? Professionally? Yes. I finished school. I actually did transfer from Minnesota to Texas. Yes. I... And then completed school there. And then uh, worked in the industry. You know, in, in America, you don't just finish school and start calling yourself fashion designer. You have to go through a certain process and the process is working for a fashion house for a period of time. You learn all the things you need to learn before you get to even call yourself an assistant fashion designer. That's like national service sort of? Sort of, yes. So I had to go through that process and finish. I worked for myself for a period of time. You know, this is a, a, a foreign country. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, I worked in every area of the industry mm. I could think of. And usually most of it was me making a choice. And it even started while I was in school. I made a decision that I wanted to learn uh, fabrics. So okay. I worked in the fabric store for a period of time. Then I wanted to learn how they altered garments. So I chose a place that did alterations and actually went there and worked there. Mm. Then I moved into the main departments to do retail for a period of time. Then I went to better dresses. Then I became a, 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 an assistant manager in a shop. Then I managed the shops itself. Wow. So I went through the processes of being a fashion designer and understanding what it really means. So I did all that. Then eventually, when uh, my daughter came, I made a, a different decision. Mm. I wanted also to do law. Okay. 
<laughs> so, <laughs> what inspired that? I there were two things I always wanted to do. Mm. It was either law or a fashion or, or law. law. But fashion was my main passion. Okay. So I decided to take a course in a paralegal program. Okay. So I did that in Houston for a year. Finished off. Worked in a law firm for seven years. Wait. And why you worked at the law firm? Where was fashion? It was a more of people placing orders and me doing the work as my own business, as opposed to working in a fashion house. I had done all the things I needed to mm -hmm, do mm -hmm. and I'd moved to doing law. Mm. I started working in the law firm, but at that time I had a business. So I was running business at the site. At the, I, I mean, for some reason, I, I feel while you were working at the law firm for seven years, I mean, you'd look at people and say, this wasn't stitched right. I mean, uh, yes, you'd go I to would, the court. I would do that. I was actually, my, my um, <laughs> the partner I was working with, each time I entered the office, she hung up a phone, she would go, my fashion statement has arrived. <laughs> <laughs> you will correct them. <laughs> yes, I would do that. Wow. Mm. And all these were experiences you had in America. Yes. Let's talk about when you decided to come back to Ghana. Um, before you, you got back in here or before your the, the Joyce Abbey influence mm -hmm. came on us, how was the fashion scene like? Well, I hadn't been, you know, I, I went, I was in the U.S. for 10 years before I visited okay. Ghana. And so uh, I always felt that, okay, I, I wasn't one of those who looked down on people yeah, as in, yeah. I'm in America, so I have this and mm -hmm. they don't have that. Mm -hmm. No. And the reason I didn't do that because I felt that even when I was in Ghana, mm -hmm. I was, I knew what fashion was. Yeah. And Afghanians do know fashion. Mm -hmm. You know, we may not create anything, but at the end of the day, we know what is in, yeah. what is out. Yeah, that's true. So <laughs> I never really looked down on anybody. So when I came, I thought about it. And at that time, I hadn't actually made up my mind to come home yet. Okay. So went back home, back to the US and my husband then decides to come home so he was home for a year and a half before I joined him Wow so when I came was when I finally decided okay what am I going to do with myself uh, you know uh, and then first I said I've worked years in the US I'm just going to lie around for a year that's what I said to myself take a vacation if, take a vacation <laughs> I brought everything yeah but in my line around I've always been one of those people is one track okay. I know what mm -hmm. I want mm -hmm. and I'm very focused I would look for a shop and the shop I made a decision I wanted it at uh, Oxford Street at Osu. the time Osu. so I will drive there every day I don't look left I don't look right I will go straight, straight. to where <laughs> Wow, yeah. determination. Just to find what it is that mm -hmm. I wanted. Mm -hmm. And then I, I, I got a phone call from somebody. She, her name is Benaifa Chothia. Okay. She's a fashion designer. I think she moved to London. She asked me that they were doing an international show and she had heard about me and she wanted me to participate. Wow. In fact, I was told at the very last minute, so I had one month to prepare. Mm -hmm. I had the machines, I had everything, but I hadn't set anything up. Mm -hmm. So I pulled them into my living room and started. So you started the Joyce Abbey brand? On that day. On that day, in your living room? In my living room. Wow. So I worked, I did, I, I loved doing gowns. So I did 13 wedding gowns. Then I did, uh, uh, I think, 11 uh, cocktail dresses, black and white, for the show. So when my turn came at the show, people stood up and clapped. I got an, a standing ovation right there, and the name just picked up. Just That's like when you that. realize, nah, this is it. Right there. This is it, like so I didn't make it. no mistake. Wow. I mean, beyond all these fun moments, you know, you get in standing ovations at your fashion shows, I, I believe there were challenges you faced when you came down. Mm -hmm. um, l let's talk about a few of them. Which, which ones were the most challenging uh, uh, things, you know, you faced? Um, it was uh, workers. Once the shop was opened and I needed workers, I realized that anybody that walked in, I had to teach. Uh, the standards we had at the time was not the thing mm -hmm. to have. And so I had to teach everybody that came in my mm -hmm. section. And then, of course, there was always the mindset of who a fashion designer is in Ghana at the time. Mm -hmm. So these were some of the challenges one was facing, uh, which actually brought about teaching. Okay. Did you ever have an issue of trust with your workers at a point? Um, 
I mean, the experience, the ones that make the cuts. Did you ever feel okay if I leave them to work, they might not produce the work like I want it? Yes, I w I'm always there. I'm 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 one of those that it has to be perfect. Mm. I like things a certain way, so the fear is it it just won't be done the way I the want way it. So want I'm it. always around. Mm. But then I will train these people to get to the point of feeling comfortable to take a step back. Then they leave and you start again. That's how it was with workers. Wow. Once they've learned enough, they move on and you start again. So that was the, the, the challenges that we were facing. And so from your living room, what was the next step for you? How big did it become after? So we, we after the show, everybody was looking for Joy Sabi View. Mm -hmm. I didn't have a shop. So my husband said, let's just put a signboard in front of the gate. <laughs> <laughs> a house. In the house. So, wow. Uh, let me tell you who my first uh, customer was. Was uh, uh, our president's former wife. She was my first customer. She came in. She bought a whole lot of stuff. Wow. That was the first time. So in that time, I made a decision about a shop in Osu mm -hmm. and moved to Osu. So we started. Wow. Working. I mean, this is super inspiring, guys. If you're listening now, you, you don't need a million dollars to set off your life. I mean, to start a no, career. People, people have, people have had that. But I mean, if if Auntie Joyce Abibio can start from her living room, post the first signage, signboard in front of their house, <laughs> and get a good client, and after that, I mean, move on to the next stage. You can do it. It's it's highly possible. And so let's look at you. Um, Auntie Joyce Abebio, the mother, I mean, the mother life. Um, you have on a number of occasions mentioned how meticulous you are with everything you do. I mean, you just mentioned it. You want things done the perfect way. Have you at any point felt it puts pressure on your children? I mean, the family, you were sad. I mean, you do that at work, but do you feel sometimes you, you do it at home too? Well, you are who you are at the end of the day, so... I'm sure I do. I mean, my, my children are grown now and will tell me exactly what they mm -hmm, think. Mm -hmm. But when they were younger, yes. Uh, I don't think I, I, I put pressure per se, but I, I kind of expect something. For instance, mm. if you need something and you really feel you should have it, I feel like you should raise an argument. Mm. Come tell me what, what it is you want, why, what's mm -hmm. the reasons behind it, that sort of stuff. For me to decide, okay, yeah, you can do this or you can't do that. Wow. But my children have been my life. So they are always the first and foremost in everything that I do. Everything that you yeah. do. What kind of parents did you aspire to become growing up? I mean, you mentioned that your dad would travel around. I mean, you barely really had time with him. Your mom was almost always around you. Growing up, what kind of parent did you want to become? And, and looking at who you are now, is it far from what you aspire to be? I don't know whether I thought much about which, what type of parent I want to be. Mm. I think part of it came from getting married very early in life. Mm. And so there was no plan. Do you get my point? There yes. was no plan. Uh, I got married. I had children. Uh, I'm very family oriented. Mm -hmm. I like, uh, I'm, and I like intimate stuff. Mm -hmm. I don't like a lot of things. So I'm usually with my family to do things together, that sort of stuff. That's the sort of mother I wow. wanted to be. Mm -hmm. And that is who you are now. And that's what I am. Yes. My boss always says, uh, simple is sweet, Eddie Blay. So I keep it simple. I mean, I don't that's like plenty of people. Nothing that's just, major. Because the people are child self. You can't really look at everybody. I mean, if there are a few, you can attend to every single one yeah. of them. Um, w what has been your greatest lesson on motherhood for the very many young mothers, the ones who are starting a business and don't know whether to uh, create a family or not? I mean, the ones who have already gone in there and are struggling managing things as a mother and a businesswoman. What is your greatest advice for them or what has been your greatest lesson? Well, I think because I started early, mm -hmm. I got married at 23. Wow. And my first daughter at 26. So I, I usually think that people should plan their lives. Okay. Uh, so if, for instance, in the school, somebody came and they were already ha pregnant or something, uh, I, ha I would ask you to take your time and think through things because the, this work we do, mm -hmm. you know, people tend to look at it as uh, it's very easy, a snap mm -hmm. of a finger mm -hmm. is not. It's a lot of work and very stressful. 
So you need to plan ahead with what you're doing. Uh, make certain decisions whether the children will come first before because during my time of uh, settling in Ghana and my children were young at the time I wanted to spend time with them but at the same time I had work mm -hmm. to do so we had an arrangement mm -hmm. I will pick them up from school in the afternoon and bring them home so I get to see them and my husband will drop them in the morning mm. and then weekends I set my 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 goals in a certain way customers do not come call me on my personal phone. Mm -hmm. Everything business is done at work. At work. It doesn't come home. Mm. So that the weekends is spent with my children. So that's how I manage myself. So I advise uh, mothers also to find a structure in their lives that they will use to be able to run their businesses as mm -hmm. well as manage the children in the house. That's very so. important. Let's speak about the joys at Bebio College for Creative Design. I mean, you mentioned that in your experience, your early experiences with workers here in Ghana, you picked that a lot of them didn't really have the, the know-how. I mean, they were called fashion designers, but didn't really know the practical work behind it. And so you set up the school. How, how easy or difficult was it for you? I mean, setting up the school. It was difficult because, uh, number one, Ghana had a mindset. People in Ghana had a mindset that those in this sector are dropouts. Well, so uh, I don't. I, I believe we've changed it quite a bit, mm -hmm. but you're still going to find a, a few people that have that same mm -hmm. mindset. So it, it meant that I had to change the mindset first mm -hmm. before I could actually do anything. So I, I I put it together, started with five students, and then used it to change the mindset of a number of people mm -hmm. because by the end of the year they were sewing and doing amazing work so parents coming to see it brought their oh ah yeah you know that sort of <laughs> stuff and things changed we started changing things slowly mm. tell us a little bit i mean we're going to go on a break but tell, tell us a little bit about the kind of young people you admit um you know in your institution what do you look out for you mentioned that when some come and let's say they're pregnant, you sit down and talk to them. Do you do you by any chance reject some of them when they come? Oh no, no, not at all. Okay, I, I, it's a school. I mm. mean, if you feel you are ready for it, mm. I think the question will be whether you can hang in till the, yeah, <laughs> the yeah. period that you are supposed to be there. But we've organized it in a way that we have a six month, six months. So if you go through the first six months, you go have your baby, you come back later, you can do the next six months. Wow. So uh, that is not, we admit anybody mm -hmm. and everybody who feels that they, they have the talent, interested in learning fashion, I will accept you. I want us to talk about the fashion industry, but of course, after uh, we take a few songs. Um, we mentioned earlier, we had a, a, a conversation before we started the interview. You really love music and you, you seem to know your music very well. I mean, you mentioned you. we played we played Simi's <laughs> song before. And then I turned to ask, uh, Auntie Joyce, you know who sang? Oh, yeah, it's Simi. I mean, it was quite easy. I wonder, do you have favorite songs now? Uh, well, the, uh, I've given you one. You should have stuck with that. And then I said Kwame Eugene. Kwame Eugene, right? The, the church boy. Yes. <laughs> Who else? Who else can we play? The Skiddy. Okay. I like his music as well. A few Nigerian, uh, the twins, what do they call themselves? P-Square? Yes, that's the one. We have some twins here too. They're called Dope Nation. Yeah. We'll play that song so you know it's fine. <laughs> just, before we move on, right, we have a quick surprise for you. Yes, I, I, everyone loves surprises. Okay. So, the team put together something special for you. I think Ken should just present it. For all of the guys who are watching us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, this is a beautiful picture oh. of Auntie Joyce. <laughs> yes, in between. I love it. I mean, this is for you. It's for accepting our invitation. It's for coming here to inspire the many listeners that we have. Let's hang it at the office. I mean, at home. Whenever you look at it, you remember that you were on the Wiley the Boat series. I mean, you remember the impact you have on the youth when it comes to our fashion industry and beyond. Yeah. I mean, I, I didn't get to do fashion, but you're one of the people I look up to as well. Very well. So like said, this is for you. It's not too late. <laughs> Auntie, Auntie Joyce has been looking at me like, okay, we'll talk after. Maybe All we'll right. talk after. Maybe I'll take a okay. course uh, in there. But this is yours. Thank you so yes. much. It's beautiful. The team will, re will receive it on, on, on Auntie's behalf. Thank so you. right after that, we can just have it in there. Back into the interview, though. Don't forget 0202 to get you in by WhatsApp. We just did a presentation for beautiful portraits of Auntie Joyce. Uh, that's for her from YFM. 
the impact of the fashion industry on some economics, our economies, sorry, economies out there, it's very, very huge. I mean, uh, I've been to Italy personally and you see how developed the country is. I mean, the country is well known for fashion. It's really done a lot for some economies in London, the USA and the rest. Can, can you say same about Ghana fashion industry? Are we ever going to get to the point where we'll have such a huge impact? We economy -wise? definitely will at you some will. point. We are not there, but we mm -hmm. will. We are working on it. What are some of the things that are holding it back? Well, I think some policies need to change to help mm. move this business forward because we have a lot of challenges from different areas. For mm. instance, those of us who want to promote African print, for mm -hmm. instance, or uh, African wear, let's yeah. put it that way. It's very difficult for us because the textile industries that we have right now are struggling. Mm. And uh, the, 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 the cost of fabric is expensive. Mm. So by the time we, the designers, get to it, we've already lost the, uh, the battle, let's put it mm -hmm. that way. We can't compete with the outside world because it becomes very expensive. And so these are some of the challenges we have, uh, bringing in uh, the right, uh, yeah. uh, what is it called, machinery to mm -hmm. be able to work is an issue because we pay lots of money f to uh, bring our stuff in. Uh, they are not produced here in Ghana, neither can you find them here to mm -hmm. buy. Mm -hmm. So usually you are importing those things in and then you come in and you have all these chunks of duty you have to pay for. That's true. So we feel that if if the government can give us some exemption in certain areas in the business that we do, mm. we may be able to compete outside. Mm. But right now, that's where our challenge is. And uh, I think there are also different cultures that we need to build for ourselves. Mm. One of them is learning to produce our garments in a manufacturing company that actually will do the work properly for you instead of us doing it anyhow, trying to uh, export those things mm -hmm. that uh, it doesn't cut it. So that we can uh, at least get our business done in our country. Mm. And open shops for ourselves. This country, we can have our designers. I mean, right now, Africa is open to us. Mm -hmm. We can do all sorts from here on. But certain things will have to change in this country for us to be able to move forward uh, and stop doing the individual jobs that we do. I was telling them the last time that the students should be able to come together and open join together and mm -hmm. have a business mm -hmm. as opposed to each person wanting to, wanting to own their own mm -hmm. we can't all be honest yes somebody has to do the work that's true and the earlier they realize that uh, zero percent or a hundred percent of zero is zero the better <laughs> because if you were with somebody <laughs> and you made 40 percent it's, yeah, it's better than zero yeah, isn't 0%. it that's true yes and we seem to work in a certain way our mindset is a little different mm. when it comes to business so some of the things we have to change speaking about mindsets auntie how do you feel when people label ghana made products or ghana made goods as being inferior to products from outside how do you feel about it i mean being well, in the fashion industry they are, they, I mean, it, it can be annoying and there's some truth to it sometimes. I think the Ghanaian needs to learn that the finishing of anything they do is important. Mm. Not just anyhow and want to sell it. Mm -hmm. Because then we have all those other people who have done all these works, very good, nicely mm -hmm. finished, mm -hmm. all of it, that we, we can compare to. Yeah. So we have to get to the point where we are we say is just as good or even better yes you see so but it is annoying to hear people say made in ghana oh that i won't buy it from ghana because this that that which is not good it's not promoting anything for mm -hmm. us we need to be able to patronize our own things and move the industry forward however we the people who are actually producing those things who need to take a step back mm -hmm. and think if i'm doing this i should do it right you know, which is what sometimes is lacking in mm. in our section. If a young person wants to set up a brand, I mean, as you mentioned, you always inspire your students to come together, to be extra creative, create brands for themselves. How do they get funding? I mean, let us in on that. If somebody wants to start a car business, the person can just send import duty slips to the bank and get funding. How, how, how does the average fashion entrepreneur get support finance wise 
Unfortunately, it's one of the things I was saying, certain things have mm. to change and certain policies and uh, structures need to be put in place mm -hmm, to support mm -hmm. us in the works that we do. Because when they usually finish, most people are depending on families, friends to support them. Uh, going to the bank uh, doesn't work because the bank is asking for a collateral you may not have. Mm -hmm. And then again, you don't even want to start a business going to the bank to pick up, uh, to get a loan that has this huge interest rate yes. sitting on it. It's, it's, it's like you are losing even before you start. Mm -hmm. So that's some of the challenges that we I feel that needs to be addressed in our country, mm -hmm. where we can support these people, people to move forward in the businesses that they are doing. But that's where the challenge is. In the transport industry, I mean, in the creative arts industry, entertainment and the likes, I've seen associations i've seen boards that's the fashion industry in ghana have anything like that to regulate things that has to do with them welfare all these things uh, we have like a for some reason fashion designers we haven't succeeded in coming together to put something together but it's something that needs to be, needs done. To be done needs to be done because i've always thought that if we could come together and and we we can be the powerhouse mm -hmm. behind certain mm -hmm. things that we can command certain things that is needed in the country, mm -hmm. get certain policies changed and that sort of stuff. Doing it as an individual doesn't help anything. Mm -hmm. So we need to be able to come together and do this. Great. I've seen a lot of fashion schools. I mean, beyond Joyce Abebio Creative Design College, there are many. In your personal opinion, do you think schools in Ghana um, have done enough generally whether the fashion schools, the tertiary institutions, the universities and the likes that we have, have they done enough to change old perceptions about pursuing a career in fashion? Um, I wouldn't say so. I think over the years, my beginning and why I got into actually opening a school and teaching was to change that mindset. Mm -hmm. I feel that we've done a lot because mm -hmm. when I started, for instance, uh, parents will bring their children upset mm -hmm. because their mind is I told them to go to Legon or again UST and all they want to do is fashion so they mm -hmm. dump the children on mm -hmm. me angry and they start to feel better when they come a year later and find what they are yeah, capable design, of yes. doing <laughs> so that's how we've been able to change mindsets mm -hmm. I am hoping that the other schools that have opened now are also working towards changing mm -hmm. all this because this is very important in our sector Wow. <laughs> How is the fashion industry, especially schools, adapting to the new normal? I mean, after COVID-19 came up, what does, uh, you know, the industry need to do to sustain itself? I mean, what is Joyce Habibu Institute doing? Are people learning online now? How are we going about things for you? When uh, it happened, we went online. Mm -hmm. Uh, we we had challenges there because you would find that you have some students that don't have even computers in their homes or they don't have a smartphone to even pick up from there so we, we look for different channels to be able to reach the students mm -hmm. like on WhatsApp mm -hmm. or something so videotape it show it to them WhatsApp let them do the project send it to you you know ours is practically based so it makes yes. it very complicated mm -hmm. it is something one has to inspect and looking at it on 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 computer or a phone doesn't cut it yeah, exactly so it makes it very difficult for us but we still tried to do it that way currently we have uh, the final year students in uh, finishing their final project mm. so I think next week we'll be done with the final project and we are waiting on uh, <laughs> can we move on yes oh, no. <laughs> so. at, at this point I, I'm going to check out a few questions from our listeners I have the first one in from Amaka um, Global Media Alliance Amaka says our former president's wife was my first customer you mentioned that um, can you please mention the president's name <laughs> my president I think, yes i think you you mentioned that our former president's wife was your first customer uh this person the current was, president the current president Ekufuado, yes. Ekufuado's former wife former wife okay 
So it's a kufado. Uh, she wanted to know. I think that the question is answered. Oh, she wasn't sure. Okay. Yes. Um, this question in here from Selassie inside his legon says, um, "Are we ever going to get to a point where the fashion industry will start shutting down uh, shabby fashion stores? I mean, people who take your fabric and display it." <laughs> This is this is wicked. That's an interesting word. <laughs> Dislay is a new. <laughs> I mean, I think it's it's when you send your but piece. It makes perfect sense. Yes, so you send you your piece to a tailor or a seamstress, and, and they will ruin it for you. Until you send them a picture of how you want it to be, and you don't get to see the product until a day before you're supposed to go where you're supposed to go, and you get a cover instead well, of a. <laughs> you know, sometimes people also need to be make certain decisions. Well, if you are looking to pay 50 CDs for well, a garment, you know where you are going. They will definitely be slayed. They will be slayed for you. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I mean, are we ever getting to the point where... Uh, the we are working on it. You're We've working been, on it. You know, Corvette has a program there that we are training apprentices to bring them up. I have a, uh, a school that we opened, a professional development okay. centers that we are raising that level mm. up. So give us some time. We'll be Sometime. there. Great. I'm sure. Do, do you ever get to the point where you reach out to people to get them trained? I mean, you see a fashion designer who has promising works. I mean, but it's not perfect. And you reach out to them to tell them, you know what, take a course at my place. Let me touch it up for you. Do you ever do that? We do that. But okay. again, at the end of the day, it's about money. So if the person has the funds to be able to come to the school, why not? Then yes. Okay. Certainly. Great. Are there other career opportunities after fashion school we may not know of and how relevant are they to the economy? You mentioned that you worked at the fashion store. I mean, I, I'm sure many people out here in Ghana don't even know they are in the fashion industry actively. People they say, are. okay, I'm, I'm a clerk at a fashion store or I'm a counter boy at a fashion store. And so me, I don't do fashion. When you mention fashion, it's the tailor or the seamstress or the person cutting with the scissors. Very wrong. What are some of the other careers you in fashion be, we don't know about? You could be a stylist. Okay. The person who is styling the president and uh, the wife and all that, mm -hmm. they are stylists, so they they in the fashion industry. You could be a retail manager. You are also in the fashion uh, industry. You could be a buyer for a shop mm -hmm. or anything. I mean, there are different areas that you can do. You could be writing on fashion. Yes, I know. Or a few blogging people. on yeah. fashion. So all that is something Fine. you have to learn from a fashion design school to get into because you have to have the total understanding of the work you're going to do. Mm -hmm. If you're going to talk about fashion, you can't just talk. You need to know what it means. Mm -hmm. 20 years from now, what would you want Joyce Abebe to be known for? Mm. Changing the fashion scene. I like the, scene hum, I like the hum that getting. <laughs> have a long yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> idea okay. of what I would like. Uh -huh. I want to be able to change the fashion scene in Ghana. I would mm. like to see Ghana become the fashion hub where production is coming from here to the other African countries. Mm. So that's what I want. This is why I got into education because I thought the first start was to educate people, mm. let them know how the work is done properly clear understanding of it then we can move it forward mm. so one thing i know is that i mean fashion designers will make the best clothes but models need to bring the clothes to life right mm -hmm. let me pick your mind on our modeling industry in ghana how well is it doing is it structured enough is it helpful to the fashion industry are, are we are we getting enough models professional models to put our clothes out there I think the, uh, the, the models I have used or I've seen around, they are quite well trained. Mm. The problem again in Ghana is the fact that if somebody is going to model and you want to pay the person peanuts, mm -hmm. you are not going to get the right group of people that That's you true. want. Because in other countries they are paid a chunk of money mm. to model and we don't in Ghana. But the ones I have seen, they are well trained I mean, and they do the job they need to do. What does Auntie Joyce Abebio do? Uh, I mean, what do you do to relax, to have a good time? If you're not teaching, if you're not mentoring the next generation of, you know, hot couture designers. I barely hear that word here in Ghana, though, I have to be honest. But, I mean, a few circles, hot couture. Uh -huh. yeah, yeah, yeah. I used to watch it on DWTV, by the way. Yeah. Until a point where I saw it mentioned on a fashion show in Ghana. Oh, we actually have some here. I mean, it's... They do? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
I mean, those ones, <laughs> correct me if I'm wrong, those are the very crazy designs. The ones that apparently you can't wear in real life, but you can wear on, on the runway. That's what couture, right? Well, it, it is, it is a, a section, mm. it's a selected group of designers. Okay. That, I mean, you actually selected to be somebody uh, who's doing hood couture or whatever it is. Wow. Uh, that, uh, because what it means is, it's very high fashion. Okay. Fabrics are, are, are expensive. Mm -hmm. Finishing is done by hand. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of handwork, mm -hmm. you know, where somebody takes a piece of something and actually designs it to come into mm -hmm. a fabric. Mm -hmm. Do you get my point? Yeah, yeah, so it's a very high end. That's why I asked they, they do Did have <laughs> <laughs> Because <laughs> fabric, you, there are but, some you see. You know, people tend to look at it from the angle that once you are doing made to measure, okay. then you are doing couture. Which but one there's is a that? lot more. Made to measure means I measured you, I did the work for you. Okay. So it, it's not uh, one that is already done. Okay, it's not already made. It's not already made. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how why people say that, yes. Wow. But there's a selected group of people that are actually the ones. In, you have to get to a certain level to level get before yeah. and we'll get there we will get there we'll get there we All just right, so have to aim high we'll get there so back to the question what do you do for fun i mean if you're not fun. teaching you're not doing all that it's not fun much fun in my life oh, i work <laughs> all day long i get home very late uh, the thing i look forward to is entering my house getting my cup of tea and mm. going to relax mm. sit down and relax so i watch a little tv go to bed that's basically my lifestyle that has been it since for a very long time very since long the time. children wow yes on the side <clears throat> aside fashion aside medical technology the bit that you studied is there a, a, a hidden talent something else that auntie joyce uh, uh joyce Abebu is into that people don't really know maybe you can sing on the side maybe mm. you can mm. <laughs> no, not at all, <laughs> not at all huh? it's all fashion and then what you studied nothing right? extra <laughs> that and then just law are you by any chance coming back to law anytime soon i do not think so you do not think so I, i'm looking to retire so i don't think i'll be going that direction after you retire what happens I, I, uh, well i've been planning my retirement i've been telling them and um my daughter is running the school for me now great and uh we we are currently building a um a campus Cool. So when that is done, I will possibly take a step and get into manufacturing. Mm. So that's what I want to do. Great. Yes. For people who are listening, like myself, who have interest in getting into fashion at any point, how do they get enrolled at the Joyce Abebio College of Creative Design? How easy is it? Do we just walk in? Oh, just walk in. Give us a call. Get on our WhatsApp talk to us we like to chat about everything so if you have questions we will answer so you can just walk in and even ask to speak to me and i will come out and speak to you or you can come to my <laughs> office whichever people would want it's to do no that problem. to confirm if they're actually at the right place so yeah <laughs> yes. can i speak to auntie so you, joyce oh people do all the time mm. they insist i'm the only one they want to talk to and mm. i will let them into my office and we will chat i don't have a problem with that at all what's the size of your closet uh, well, Personally. I have quite a size, I must say. <laughs> and you, do, you, do, you keep, do you keep a whole room? A whole yes, section of the house for that? It's a whole room, yes. Wow. Anyways, thank you so much for spending time with us today. <laughs> I'm sure you often come across many young people who are at crossroads, uh, you know, for identifying themselves. I mean, find their personal identity, um, their purpose in life and all that. What do you often tell them and what would you tell anyone listening right now, any young person here? this very moment struggling to find themselves in terms of making the right career choice i mean making the best decisions for their future and now i say they should stay focused mm. committed dedicated in in their their thoughts and their mm. mind and mm. the direction they are going mm. i want to read something somebody said uh, that i listened to that i thought was a good one mm for young people to know. He said, if it were easy, there'll be no one to look up to. Mm -mm. Keep walking, keep striving, never give up. Fall down seven times, stand up eight times. Without commitment, you'll never start. And without consistency, you'll never finish. Ease is the greater 
uh, is a greater threat to progress mm. to progress than hardship. Wow. What a beautiful way to wrap up. Thank you so much, Auntie Joyce, for spending time with us. We are humbled. We appreciate this moment. I mean, this has been inspirational to a lot of people out there, including myself. Thank you. Ghana loves you. Keep doing what you do. I mean, we have a big mission. The fashion industry still needs to survive. I mean, I believe in every single sector with human resources impacting our general economy at some point. We'll get there. We, we definitely believe in that. And so kudos to you on a big mission you're on. Shouts going out to the JACCD guys, everybody there. I mean, from today, I think I have a lot of listeners from that side. God bless all of you guys. And uh, help us say thank you to Auntie Joyce for spending time with us on the Wiley The Board series. We appreciate you. Have a wonderful day. Thank you so much too. Any for final words, me. anything you want to say to anybody, anybody you'd like to mention, your team? My team, definitely. I don't know what I'm doing about them. <laughs> They, they are my rocks. Mm. I cannot do anything without them, especially my lecturers. They are amazing. They've been with me for 12, 14 years, wow. and they've been amazing. Great. Thank you so much, Thank Auntie. Thank you very much, too. All right. So that was Auntie Joyce uh, Abebio, president of the uh, Joyce Abebio Creative, actually College for Creative Design, right here in Ghana. Make sure you check them out on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, search for them on Google. If you want to enroll, if you have the dream of getting into the fashion industry, it's still structured, there's proper training for that. Make sure you go on there and acquire the proper training that you deserve. Of course, uh, when you get there too, please make sure you call Auntie Joyce. She's available whenever you want to talk. Always, she did for you. <laughs> Thank you so much, guys. All of the guys that texted on Twitter with the hashtag Wiley the Board Series, we appreciate it. Congratulations. You found the one station that plays Ghana's best urban music. to YFM 107.9 Accra, 102.5 Kumasi, and 97.9 Itakarati. 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 Itakarati.